Thank you, Phil, for coming on the podcast and taking the time. I appreciate it and been looking forward to the conversation. Uh, we've met a while ago, I guess, on the internet somewhere and been in touch a lot on, you know, Farcaster and elsewhere. I know you are a founding member at Bright Moments and generally just deep in crypto and involved in all these sorts of projects. Uh, so looking forward to digging into a bunch of that. But I think before we go too deep, uh, it would be great to get your story from uh, as early as you're willing to start to where you are today and talk about uh, some of the decisions you made along the way. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Jake. Um, looking forward to it. Uh, so I, I was born uh, in Buffalo, New York, and I grew up in a, a little town called Attica. And Attica is known for two things, our rodeo and the maximum security prison. Um, we are a pretty small town and we're one of the largest school districts in the state of New York. And that's because, you know, not in terms of student population, but I live in a very rural area. And so we're very spread out. And so growing up, you know, um, I had friends that were, uh, live very far away from me. And because of that, I had to sort of develop my own hobbies. Um, I'm the youngest, I've got two older sisters and, and my parents are both entrepreneurs, but they've never called themselves that or think about themselves that way. But it's only really over time that I've sort of realized that what they were doing growing up is, um, you know, trying to carve out a life for themselves through their own initiative and, you know, having control rather than working for somebody else. Uh, my dad has his own law practice, uh, which he ran out of a small shed on my property. Uh, and he grew that over, you know, my childhood um, before going into public service. Uh, he's an elected uh, official. He's the county court judge. And my mom, um, you know, worked with my dad to help him grow the business. Uh, she now uh, runs a car dealership as well as a self-storage unit in our town and has been on the town board um, in my town for as long as I can remember. And that means things like making sure the roads are paved, making sure that the utilities function. And sort of this really interesting just American system that I think uh, take a lot of people take for granted. And so very young, I sort of saw the um, value of being able to choose things you're interested in and just grinding away at them for many years. And my parents are very good at setting a goal and then, you know, not talking about it for two or three years and just sort of steadily making progress. Um, my childhood was pretty isolated, idyllic. Uh, we didn't really have a lot of, you know, people that were famous or that were involved in cutting edge industries. And I became interested in computers pretty young. Um, one of my earlier memories is we had a, a school network system that was pretty new and teachers could store files and students could access it from, you know, anywhere uh, once they're logged into the system. And I, I managed to find a way to hack into the system and, and download a cracked version of Age of Empires onto it. So my friends and I could play during study hall. And so, you know, sort of early on, I realized like, hey, if you know more about this digital sphere, you can do things uh, that other people don't even realize is possible. Um, and uh, I now looking back can sort of see how these interests converge, you know, one on the sense of people being able to self-govern and self-organize and then two with computers. But I don't think at the time I really realized that it was anything that I could maybe make a living doing. It was just what interested me and what I was exposed to. I ended up going to school a couple hours away at a place called Syracuse. Um, Syracuse is a pretty big school. There's a strong athletic presence. Um, I got pretty involved in the, the social scene there in Greek life. And my original major started as biology. Um, but I very quickly realized that I, I didn't want to go into pre-med. And so I switched into biochemistry, which, which sounded more difficult and sort of was closer to the, the types of things I was interested in. Um, but I realized that I wouldn't be able to really pursue a career without continuing my education to graduate school. And so I finally switched into bioengineering, which sort of combined both worlds, right? It let me have this like strong academic interest while also still what, what I felt was playing with computers and what other people, you know, called programming classes. And so, so I really liked the fact that I was able to get credits by essentially, you know, creating algorithms and, and doing programming work that I was already doing in my free time. I, um, had a bunch of gigs in college, some blue collar things like, you know, working construction, working um, uh, at, at a local landscaping company, and then others that were sort of more academic. I worked in a research lab where the, the professor there was studying upper arm movement and, and orthopedics. And so I spent a lot of time with cadavers and trying to uh, just uh, identify the way that the motions, you know, differed across people with different injuries. And so a lot of that was, was sort of interesting. I feel like I got a pretty broad cross-section of the types of careers that were available early on. 
and what I like doing. And coming out of college, I, I was offered a, a job at Deloitte, which is a, a consulting firm that has um, offices all over the world. And I joined their analytics department. And it was useful for me to see, you know, the way that a lot of businesses worked on the inside. But I think about a year in, I realized that I wasn't sure if any of the work that we were doing actually really mattered. We would work for clients on sort of nebulous projects and create PowerPoint decks, but the output of the work seemed to be more about convincing the executives of the company, something they already knew and being able to provide a cover story than it was actually producing anything new. And this sort of became apparent to me. One of my jobs was we were on a big project and we were onboarding a few dozen people every week. And I was tasked with the assignment of sort of manually taking the data and putting it into the system. And, you know, I spent about a week uh, staying up all night, programming it and automating it. And for maybe a month, I got away with it where I'd come in every morning, I'd press a button on the computer and then sort of kick my feet up. And one day my manager came in and said, Hey, what are you doing? And I showed him. And rather than, you know, trying to surface it to the client, he says, you can't show anybody this, right? Because it was, it was not sort of within the scope of work. Um, and, and that was sort of a very telling lesson for me. And I realized at this time that, you know, it, it's useful to sort of have, uh, colleagues within existing institutions, but if I wanted to be able to find things that were interesting to me, I needed to carve out my own path. And so I, I started working on tons of side projects. Um, some of them were crypto related. I have an NFT project from maybe 2018 or 2019 that I launched that I wanted to assign people. Uh, non-fungible tokens to verify their age so they could use certain websites. And this was right when the, the CryptoKitties spec was sort of being finalized and the ERC-721 standard wasn't quite done yet. So I think it was a little bit too early. And I also got really interested in AI. Um, the firm was pushing a lot of AI initiatives. And so, you know, I, I got pretty deep into to machine learning and neural networks. And a lot of this is just linear algebra, which I was familiar with from my degree in bioengineering. And so I was, you know, trying to find projects that intersected these interests. Um, I then got an offer to, to lead the blockchain division within uh, a large health insurance company in the US, a Fortune 30 company, you know, one of the biggest um, in the world. And it, it was interesting you know, to try to drive it forward because they didn't really have a good sense of what the technology could do, but they were clearly interested in, in being able to share data more freely. And I worked there for a couple of years and helped spin out uh, what became uh, a startup and a consortium that's still active today. And I, I sort of got to a tipping point where I realized, hey, do I want to continue you know, working on this sort of business development role or do I want to jump and do something else? And at the same time, I had started a, a crypto mining company, um, mining Ethereum with GPU farms with one of my friends from college. And it sort of seemed to me like this, you know, opportunity of working in smaller companies was just more suited to my lifestyle. So I, I left uh, the organization once they spun out the, the consortium and I joined a, a small startup working on a decentralized protocol that has a few, a few billion users, uh, which is email. And my thought process at the time was, you know, I'm really interested in crypto. It seems like we're still pretty early. And there's companies that are being built or sort of past the protocol phase, but I want to get a sense of what this looks like from the other end. I want to see what a decentralized protocol looks like once it's already reached critical adoption and what lessons we can learn. Uh, and so I worked with the, the team at Shortwave for uh, a little over a year and I, I was sort of, I was done with, with crypto, right? I, I had done the mining thing. I had spun out the, the, you know, blockchain business consortium. And I was like, yeah, you know what? I'm going to take some time and, and go work in a startup and put my head down and just sort of focus on sort of a traditional technology path to try to build some network within Silicon Valley. And of course, as soon as I stopped looking for, for crypto, it found me. And at this time I was living in Venice Beach, California, and I was spending a lot of time, you know, trying to find other people that had shared interests. Um, and I ran into, I ran into Seth, who is the founder of Bright Moments. And he said, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm starting an NFT gallery. Uh, you should come by. And, and I swung by and that was how I got introduced to Bright Moments. And that's sort of where the current, the current story starts, but that feels like a pretty good summary of, uh, you know, the first two decades of my life. Yeah, no, it's an awesome story. I think uh, there's a bunch of interesting threads to pull on, but uh, one I might sort of start with is uh, when you, you know, you join this email company, like you said, sort of seeing what a late stage decentralized protocol might look like. Um, before that, you had started this uh, Ethereum mining company in Texas on, on the side of what you were doing. 
these are pretty unusual sort of first, you know, steps into the world of crypto versus like most people who are like, oh, you know, I learned about crypto from like Bored Apes or like I learned about, you know, Ethereum when it launched or whatever it might be. Um, they're like, you know, or I got into Solana. Not a lot of people came in through like mining and then were like, oh, you know, I'm going to go see what like email looks like. There's a pretty like unique paths in. I'm curious, like what about those entry points? And maybe there are others as well. Um, you know, does that give you sort of a different perspective on crypto sort of fundamentally what it's useful for versus, you know, other people who might have got in from more of an investment perspective, just buying and selling tokens or whatever it might be? Well, I mean, I, I, mean, I think it's a different layer of the stack. And I, I, I love to read. I've been a reader my whole life. Um, I'm, I, I read when it's dangerous. Like I'll read while driving a car and I always have a book stashed under my driver's seat. Um, it's, it's like a compulsion. Uh, there, there's a Japanese word for it, which is sundoku, which is the, the habit of buying books faster than you can read them. And they pile up on your nightstand and floor. And I definitely have, have that affliction. And so, I, you know, I, I think I became very interested in the history of technology and I've read uh, as much as I can get my hands on, not only about Silicon Valley, but also just different waves of business before that. And I, I think crypto, the culture is really interesting because everyone believes, hey, let's rip this thing down and start from the ground up. But in a lot of ways, we're reinventing things that have already existed. And crypto is going to have to integrate with the real world at some point. And so, you know, I'm very interested in seeing how do we fit into the broader trend of technological adoption and growth and how can we learn from previous lessons to make sure that we sidestep some of the issues with the early internet and with, you know, sort of decentralized movements in general. Um, there's a, a great book, uh, The Innovators, which is by Walter Isaacson, and he talks about some of the, the early digital movement that uh, Stuart Brand led in San Francisco um, around the whole earth um, catalog and and, and you know, trying to get people to understand what was happening with the digital revolution. And I think in some way, you know, crypto is still in that phase. Um, there's a group of people who are really passionate about that and you need early adopters, but you also need to be willing at some point to accept how your vision is going to be able to enter the mainstream. And I think, you know, email is something that we all live and work with and it's so boring. We just take it for granted that it works. Um, but there's a lot of really interesting lessons there. Yeah, totally. I think, um, you know, I, I'm not surprised to hear that books were at the origin of some of this interest. I, I read uh, on your blog or on your website, you've got this long list of all these books that you've read. And it's like, you know, extremely long to the point where I'm not surprised that you keep a book under your, uh, under your driver's seat and on the bedside table. But, um, you know, talking about crypto, there's a bunch of different sort of angles we can take on it. But one that's outside of, you know, money or Bitcoin, sort of the most fundamental, I think, is uh th that's still fairly fundamental and and quite important i think is uh decentralized social media and you know that's how like i mentioned at the top of the podcast we connected largely on on farcaster which is one of the more interesting projects out there uh certainly the one that i've spent the most time on over the longest period of time others have been you know like there's bitclout um recently like friends tech which is sort of a different version of that in a way where there's more speculative investing in people Farcaster is very sort of non-money oriented. Um, and then there's been others as well. I think Lens and GM.xyz was a little one that I played with for a while. And people are trying to figure this thing out, but it's not that easy to build a new social network, especially when we've got, uh, you know, I was going to say really good ones. I don't know if that's the right word, but uh, really, uh, you know, highly used and arguably addictive ones like Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and Twitter. Um, but nonetheless, some ambitious projects are trying and, and Farcaster seems to sort of have some momentum. So I'm curious, sort of your thoughts on, uh, you know, decentralized social in general, what you've enjoyed about Farcaster, and uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about your involvement with Purple, which is uh, sort of this Farcaster related DAO that you're part of. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I haven't spent too much time on some of the other protocols, but uh, I think I'm, I'm FID 149 on Farcaster. You know, the, the Merkle manufacturing team is based out of here in Venice. And so that's how I, I think we first got in touch and I, I joined the, the protocol. You know, I think, I think a social network is always a function of the quality of its users. And if you can think about the, the chats that you've had with friends over the course of your life or different forums that you've been involved with, you can tell when something's active and when it has a life of its own. 
And that's usually when it's a, a space for conversations that can't happen elsewhere. Whenever you try to have two conversations about the same thing, you know, it either fractures the community, there's sort of a winner take all where one dries up. And I think Farcaster has done a really good job of being the place for conversations about Ethereum for Ethereum users, right? At, people talk about crypto, but a lot of them don't use it. And then crypto Twitter is sort of, you get this interesting sort of influencer mentality where people are able to bootstrap the, the, the Twitter network to grow really quickly. And because Farcaster has always been a small network, it feels like uh, sort of a, an isolated community or like one of these islands that's segmented from the rest of the world for a long time, which gives it the opportunity to sort of grow in different directions. And I've always been interested in it because I think, you know, these messaging layers are really fundamental. And as I mentioned earlier, if you look at the trends of sort of decentralized networks, messaging has always been a core component. And there's always various waves that happen. And it feels like with the rise of people creating Ethereum wallets, with it being easier for people to, to go on chain, there needs to be an associated messaging layer. And I think the Farcaster team has the combination of the credentials as well as the right strategy to get people to actually bootstrap on top of it. Um, protocols succeed if that's where the developers are and developers want to join a protocol if that's where the users are. And so I think the path that Farcaster has taken has been really promising. And you always look for clues, right? And it's not super obvious, but you sort of have to squint to see it. And I think Purple was a really interesting clue, which is, hey, there's this group of people who are not associated with the core team. It's not some paid group. It's not some you know ecosystem fund that has a bunch of money from an ICO. It's a group of people putting their own capital at stake to try to grow the network. And the incentives felt very aligned, right? As a Farcaster user, sure, you know, I'm getting interesting content, but I'm also doing it because I'm, I'm doing a calculation, which is if this network grows and I'm an early and active user on it, I'm going to be able to have an outsized presence here compared to what I would be able to do on Twitter today, where I have to worry about competing with accounts that have 100,000 or a million followers. And by the way, if I say the wrong thing, I might get deplatformed. And I think Twitter has been moving in the right direction in terms of free speech, but I'm not you know, under any illusion about whether or not someone would care about deleting my account. It's like you know, an elephant swatting a fly off its back. You wouldn't even think about it with some of these networks. And so you really need credibly, credible neutrality. And I think Farcaster is a good shot at becoming that. Um, you know, just a quick note on Purple. Um, it, it sort of is a similar level of decentralization where everyone's joined DAOs where there's actually, you know, a multi-sig at, at the end of it. And for some DAOs, that could be okay, right? If they really need to have a clear mission and they really need to get things done, it's okay to have a group of people who are driving it forward in what you mostly have as a token aligned community. Purple isn't that. Purple is more like an alternative to open source funding. And if you look at a lot of the open source projects today, they're actually funded by corporations, which works really well as long as they're in this growth mode where they're throwing off cash. But it, it really doesn't feel nice to have some of our more core software infrastructure uh, funded at the whims of corporations. And so I'm excited about Purple as a potential you know, new institution to be able to fund developers building on top of decentralized protocols. Right. So then taking a, a, a brief tangent from, uh, you know, the crypto side of things, I noticed something interesting in, uh, you know, checking out your Twitter, you follow just, I think, three people or three uh, accounts. And one of them is uh, stop, stop scrolling or something like that, where they just literally tweet like five times a day to, you know, different variations of stop scrolling, get off your phone. And uh, it resonated with me because I've sort of, I think Twitter is like one of the most amazing things in the world, uh, at least on the internet. Um, but I also think it's like one of the worst things and one of like the most dangerous things, basically. And you have to make sure that sort of you're using it and not letting it use you and whatever. Um, so I'm curious if you have any sort of thoughts on that and practices for how you use it and, and Farcaster as well, for that matter, or generally your phone or whatever else it might be. Um, I know you had a, another interesting blog post that I read on, on boredom and uh, the value of boredom. And I'm a big proponent of that. It's extremely hard to sort of shut everything off these days and just be bored for a little while but i think it's super useful so uh, i'm curious if there's any sort of tricks of the trade or, or things you think about in terms of managing you know living on the internet but also trying to unplug once in a while and uh you know get bored yeah so so i i, I have a theory here right which is obviously twitter is a slot machine we all know that and most of the the services that we use that are in the top 10 are also slot machines right you pull the lever Sometimes it gives you nothing, but one every 10 times it gives you something. 
And so like, you know, the EV of going on Twitter is negative most of the time, right? Slightly negative. It's a little bit of a waste of time every time you open the app. But once in a while you open it and boom, you hit a jackpot. You come across some tweet or you reach out to some person or have some conversation that totally changes your life. And so it gets you to keep coming back because sort of, you know, in aggregate, yeah, sure. Maybe it's, you know, a positive expected value, but most of the time you're using it, like the medium time you open the app, it's a waste of time. And so, I, you know, I, I am not going to beat a team of a hundred product managers in Silicon Valley who spend every waking moment of their life convincing me how to stay on the app. I just, I, I'm, there's no way I'm going to beat it. So you have to fight software with software. And so I've got a pretty sophisticated stack that used to be really complicated, but has gotten easier over time with some of the recent updates to iOS. Um, and it basically just gives me a little zap in my brain every time I try to do something. And, and the trick is to program these things when you're feeling um, motivated, because at six o'clock in the morning, when you wake up and go to check your phone, your brain is in dopamine mode and you're not going to be able to have the self-control. So you need to sort of set up guardrails for yourself while you're motivated to do so that then you don't have to think about later. And so, yeah, the, the, the people I follow on Twitter is one reminder of that, where if, if I go on Twitter on a given day, my home feed is just like, get off, stop scrolling. It's not worth it. Uh, I also use, you know, a bunch of things on my phone, like screen time. Um, I've got some apps that I use to help, you know, give me time limits and things like that. And I just generally think that more people need to be aware of how they spend time um, because, you know, especially if you don't have a purpose and you're going on, it's really easy to waste entire hours or days really, really sort of meaninglessly. And that feels like a shame. Yeah, it's this, uh, that's all really interesting. And I sort of, I have some systems that are maybe not as complicated or uh, sophisticated rather, but I have systems nonetheless. And I think uh, it's interesting, the slot machine, you know, I've heard that uh, before and it, it's not like the first time I've heard that, but I never thought of it exactly in the way that you put it. And um, I just never really thought about it deeply before, but it's interesting because I think it actually is genuinely difficult to determine whether it's like a positive return to player game or if the house always wins in the end, uh, I don't really know. Uh, and that's sort of like the hardest part. It's like, and then there's another component of if you spend an average of 10 or 15 minutes a day on Twitter, like is it diminishing returns where if you spend 10, 15 minutes a day or, you know, an hour or two a week or whatever it is, um, it has like sort of a better return to player than if you spend hours or could it be that actually the more time you spend on Twitter, the better of a game it gets for the players. And, you know, I don't know. So it's one of the things that I deal with. But fundamentally, if I spend, you know, multiple hours of a day on Twitter, I don't end the day very happy. And uh, if I don't spend too much time on my phone, I tend to have good days. So that's sort of like enough of math for me, I guess. Yeah, everyone's going to reach their own sort of, you know, answer there. And I, I think that for many people um, who do understand that it's a game and understand how to play it, it's probably a positive, a positive expected value. However, I am not under any impression that the majority of people on social media um, are probably not using it in a way that's bettering themselves and are really at the whims of what the algorithm wants to show them. And that is something that I'm hoping, you know, client diversity and decentralized social media can really help with. Because when everything's aggregated under an advertising business model, there's really not much you can do in terms of innovation or even like subscriptions to try to get people, you know, Elon says, you know, something about unregretted user minutes. And I actually think that's a really strong metric. And, and I think he's fairly earnest. And so I'm going to take him at face value at that. But I don't think that that's the case or the equilibrium for a lot of the social media companies that run the world today. Right. So uh, let's talk about uh, your main project uh, that you're spending most of your time on these days. That's Bright Moments. Uh, and Crypto Citizens is sort of like the related uh, NFT project for membership to Bright Moments. But uh, maybe you could just, uh, well, even before we get into it, maybe you could talk a little bit about sort of like how you got into art, which is not sort of evidently apparent from like studying bioengineering in school and everything, and then how you sort of got involved with Bright Moments and, and what it is fundamentally. Yeah, so I, you, you know, I, um, I think that generative art and the type of work that I do today is another chapter in an existing art movement. But I am not a person who has studied the entire movement, and I'm probably, you know, woefully underprepared to give someone an entire history on, on how it, it it came to be. Compared with the history of technology, I have not spent nearly as much time digging in, and that's had pros and cons, right? On the positive side, I think we've done a lot of things that have been, you know, if, if you 
hit knew the history, you might say, oh, that'll never work. And it turns out to work because obviously today is different. On the other side, you know, I'm still every day learning about how we can sort of contextualize what we're doing within a broader history. And so I've tried to spend a lot of time, you know, talking to people who have been involved in different art movements or even different just adjacent creative movements. I mentioned Stuart Brand, and I think there, there's a lot of parallels to what was happening in San Francisco uh, and what's happening today. Um, we are fundamentally trying to create you know experiences around digital assets and i can talk a little bit about how we started but this idea of sort of on-chain permanence is really new i think that it is you know maybe where the internet was in 1995 when commercialization opened up and we're still at the phase of like trying to get a web browser on most people's computers with these wallets and so, you know, even to be going and talking about applications, like, yes, that we, we definitely need that for user adoption, but most people don't even have Netscape on their computer yet. And that's where we need to spend a lot of time educating people and allowing them to find their own path sort of into the ecosystem. And I spend a lot of time trying to teach people and, and, and personally onboarding them. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And uh, I think sometimes when it comes to like, especially creativity, ignorance gets a bit of a bad rap like i think it can actually be enormously helpful to not really know what came before you see like you know typically if a startup is created by a bunch of like industry experts it's sort of less likely to be truly innovative and pioneering and disruptive um than you know something that's created by someone who doesn't have experience with the industry but generally has good you know head on their shoulders and thinks from first principles you think of elon going and doing what he's done in several industries obviously it's always silly to use him as an example because he's just insane but um you know nonetheless there's other examples as well so uh i think one of the most interesting things about bright moments to me is um the way that you guys have sort of bootstrapped this community uh you know globally which is not totally unusual but also within you know real life you know in real life component where it's not just a discord but it's people in you know uh la it's people in new york it's people in berlin london Tokyo, et cetera. And uh, so you, I mean, you guys aren't even playing around with like, okay, it's like, you know, LA, San Francisco and San Diego, like you guys are going full on global from the beginning and uh, bootstrapping communities in each of these places and then doing these sort of like kickoff events, but um, also sort of maintaining activity in each of these places at the, the galleries that you're opening to display these, um, you know, pieces of artwork. So any thoughts on sort of uh, principles that you've sort of, I, I imagine you've sort of got a bit of a playbook by location seven or eight versus when you were, you know, opening the second and just sort of principles for building communities in the modern world, you know, internet first, and then sort of bringing them to fruition in the real world. Yeah. I mean, we couldn't have started at any other time or place than Venice beach, California in the spring of 2021. This confluence of different events came together that allowed us to exist. And if we tried to replicate the origin story today, I'm not sure it would work. But there were some sort of generalizable things that happened that we've been able to tweak. And so just taking you know back to that, that May in 2021, there was this insane interest in cryptocurrencies that was really you know grassroots. It was growing organically, fueled by zero interest rates. Pandemic had also just ended more or less, right? Lockdowns were just being lifted, but most existing businesses still had safeguards in place. And so we were able to sort of as a new organization say, hey, wait a minute, like this isn't six months ago. Uh, what are people looking for? And people really wanted to be together. You know, we had been locked inside for over 12 or 18 months at that point and really just wanted human to human interaction. And so we sort of took these two things and put them together and, and opened this gallery in Venice Beach where because everything is on chain and permissionless, we could show NFTs and we just wanted to educate people and bring them into the gallery. And we would do shows for artists and people would come to the shows and inevitably they'd say, hey, I wanna buy this, how do I get it? And we'd say, oh, you know, you have to open a MetaMask wallet and you have to write down your 12 magic words and put it on a piece of paper. And you're trying to do this during an event when music's playing and they've had a couple beers and like you've lost them. And so, there was this idea, which is, well, what if we gave away NFTs for free during the day to bring people into the gallery? And then when they come back for the artist shows, they'll already have a crypto wallet. They'll have a little bit of ETH in it. They'll, they'll know the drill. And because they got a free NFT, they'll know, you know, if they want to buy the artwork, they can do so. And this project became what was the Crypto Venetians. And 
very soon it became obvious that this was the interesting thing. We launched an art blocks, which was very fortunate. Um, Jeff Davis was one of the first artists that we did a, a show with in Venice Beach on, on June 24th. And because of that, we were in touch and we said, hey, you know, we have this idea. We want to do crypto punks, but in Venice. And Jeff said, oh, we, we should use art blocks. You could do it on that. And so crypto Venetians became a uh, sub 100 project in art blocks or project number 95. And we had this requirement, which was you need to come in person. You need to come in person. You can't mint it online. In a world where everyone is able to get something for free and they're used to minting online, you needed to get in your car or got, get in a plane and fly to Venice Beach and walk into this gallery at you know 3 to 5 p.m. every day and mint your crypto Venetian. And we made a little ritual out of it, right? There was a few of us working in the gallery at that time. I say working, but it was really a volunteer thing. I was sort of still at shortwave trying to balance you know, my existing work with this sort of really rapidly growing community. And what it became was this really strong on-chain symbol where everyone that had one of these assets was also telling us, hey, I am not only, you know, a, a person that knows about generative art, but I, I, I know enough that I'm in on the secret where in Venice Beach, there's this really interesting cultural movement happening. And look, I can prove it because it's in my wallet. And it became almost like a, a status symbol or a credential and then because we were in this period of rapidly inflating asset prices, the crypto Venetians became worth a lot of money. And it was actually really scary. It was like we were giving away 10 or 15 of these things every day. And at one point they were trading for $15,000, $20,000. And so we're giving away what was essentially cars to people that would sign up. And it showed us a lot about human nature. It showed us a lot about greed. It showed us a lot about how to you know, understand people's intentions. And we sort of made it through this initial period, uh, not without, you know, some some hiccups. At one point, an internal member of the team actually heisted, uh, you know, uh, 209 crypto Venetians and essentially embezzled them. And that's a whole other story. But we made it through this initial period and said, there's something worth doing here. We can do this and take this model and replicate in other cities. And so we went to New York, we went to Berlin, we went to London. Mexico City, Tokyo, and we're getting ready to head to Buenos Aires, Paris, and Venice. And when we're done, there's going to be 10 cities around the world that are voted on by the holders of these tokens. And those 10 communities that exist in the physical world will be networked together through this online token. And all of these people will have gone through the same initiation ritual. And it's, it's different in every city, but the fundamentals are the same, which is you come in person, you meet the team, you meet other community members, and you have a shared experience. And, and we do our best to make that experience something that you'll never forget as long as you live. And that's a really high bar, but also a lot of people don't have the opportunity to travel. And so even going to one of these cities, which tend to be some of the best cities in the world, is a bucket list item for many. And we layer on top of that the opportunity to be present with other people that have shared interests. And if you're someone who's into crypto and none of your friends get it, and you finally go to an event in a foreign city, it feels like this, oh my God moment, like people understand they're speaking the same language. And the feedback we've gotten, you know, it's, I've worked in startups, I've worked in big companies, Bright Moments isn't either of those. We're an on-chain organization, we're a project. We are, you know, probably the worst capitalists of all time. Like every ETH that we make, we funnel it back into the project and try to just throw better and better events. Um, but the feedback that we get from people is like, this changed my life, or I've met someone, you know, amazing through this and we're best friends now. And it's sort of this really compelling feedback loop that's able to motivate us to keep going, uh, despite how sort of difficult it's been with the broader market conditions, as well as just the toll of being on the road for almost two years. Yeah, it's all super interesting and obviously struck a chord. And it was interesting what you said, just to kick, kick that off was like, you know, this probably like you hear of things that you know it was like too early like that nft side project you described that you had worked on with the uh sort of age verification but it's not often that something comes along it's like it wasn't too early but it also like could have been too late and there was just a particular time in a particular place that made something work so it's really cool that you guys were able to sort of strike lightning in, in a sense in uh venice beach in 2020 i believe you said uh and covid or 2021 2021 yeah 2021 anyway. 2021 it was right when the restrictions were lifted, right? And so people were so hungry to come in person. And we would do every week, we would get together twice a week. And it was a volunteer group. We'd have a meeting where you'd sit in a circle. What can you contribute to the organization? What are your ideas? 
And then on Thursday nights, we'd throw these events. And then we sort of layered in this concept of live minting, which is what we do now for artists everywhere. And we help artists uh, bring their work to life with the collector present. And for anyone who's ever gone to a museum or sort of, you know, seen something that is more abstract, it can be really hard to understand what the artist is thinking or feeling. And so we try to make sure that the collector is always present when the art is being revealed. And, and that moment feels like magic. It's like we realized very early on there's something really special here because it's on chain, because it's non, you know, you can't fake it. There's just a lot of things that weren't possible with previous technologies that crypto has enabled. And it's really allowed us to be international. Um, it doesn't matter what language you speak. People all over the world really, really tend to love this. So when you talk about a, uh, I don't want to use the wrong terminology, but like basically a kickoff event or the initial mint at one of these locations that you're, you're opening. The next one I think is, is in Argentina and Buenos Aires. Um, these other ones you've done, like pick one that you like, or maybe talk about the Buenos Aires one coming up, but I'm curious to sort of get the, you know, start to finish or the high level of like what actually goes into the kickoff, you know, are people buying these, um, you know, crypto citizens now of the given city up front. And I know there's, you sort of have to like show up with this NFT in order, first of all, that gives you access and then you have the ability to mint one of these things. And so how's like the actual process go for people who might be listening now and, and interested. And then also like in Argentina, for example, like, is this, you know, 50% of the people are flying in from, LA, New York, and other places where you've done these? Or is this like a lot of Argentinians are there? Um, just sort of painting a picture of what it's actually like to be in one of these events that sounds like it's a pretty unique experience. Sure. So, so I, I think about it in three phases. There's the pre-mint, the mint, and the post-mint. And each one has different psychological effects on you know the team doing it. It's, it's really hard, frankly, because there's, there's so much work involved and you're in a new environment. And so the pre-mint, what we do is we fly down to the city that's been selected by our community. And we, we always do sort of a vote that's looking forward. So Paris was just chosen, for example. So I just got back from Paris. And about six months ago, we went to Buenos Aires for the first time. And we send down a small advance team and we basically plant our flag there. And we're like, hey, you know, here's who we are. Here's what we've done. Early on, we had nothing to show. And so people were like, you know, who are you? And we'd say, well, we're nobody. And it's like, well, what have you done? And we're like, eh, well, nothing really. And it's like, what are you planning? And we're like, we're not sure, but it's going to be really good. And, and now over time, we've sort of been able to show past examples. And so in the pre-mint, we send out a small team and we identify local artists, people that live in that city who are within our sort of very niche, this idea of generative or AI art. And especially if they're doing work on chain, that really helps. But we also bring artists on chain as well. And we put together essentially a, a collection. Think about this like a music festival where there's 10 headliner artists who maybe you know, maybe some you don't, and but you'd like to discover. And we broadcast it to our community. We say, hey, we, we've gone to Argentina. We found 10 artists. Uh, here are going to be the dates. Plan your travel. And that is sort of our initial planting the flag. We then raise revenue by selling some of the art ahead of time. And we sell that through this idea of a mint pass, which is basically a ticket to come mint the work in person. Uh, as it relates to our crypto citizens, we sell a third of them. And you know that is basically saying, hey, I definitely want a citizen from the city. I want to be a member of the you know, crypto Patagonian community. We airdrop a third for free to existing members on the stipulation that they come in person. And what this does is it creates a really interesting mix. You get people coming from Tokyo, coming from Berlin, coming from Mexico. And then an, another third, 334 out of the thousand, which is the largest percentage, we give away for free to locals. And that's how we bootstrap the community. And so we take the art, which essentially provides, you know, an entertainment and a shared experience, uh, sort of a creative uh, opportunity and an outlet. And then we take the membership and we give them access to the artists. And then we do our best to throw a world-class event. And so, for example, in Buenos Aires, it's from no November 2nd to the 5th of this year. And so we, uh, I don't want to share too many of the spoilers, but we rented out what was essentially a uh, private residence when Argentina was at the peak of its economic powers. It was built with hope for the future. It's very opulent. And obviously times have not gone well for the country, but there's still this sense of like optimism very embedded into the place. And over two or three days, we'll reveal all the artwork live. The crypto Patagonians will be revealed. And then for a small group of collectors, 
we're flying 50 people down to the end of the world in Patagonia for a special mint with Deaf Beef. And, and Deaf Beef is an on-chain audiovisual generative artist. He's also a blacksmith. And so he's hand forged 100 steel objects that we're going to uh, reveal to collectors in a live experience. And you can think about this like, you know, it's a combination of a consumption good, a travel experience, you know, a music festival, uh, a community, a membership club. It's all of these things and none of them at the same time. And we try to do something that's unique to every city, right? So what we did in Tokyo is very high tech. What we did in, what we're planning in Buenos Aires is we're calling it on-chain offline, right? So it's, it's very sort of analog. And we really want to make sure that each experience feels authentic to the place that we're going. And so we work with the locals, we get them onboarded early, and, and then we give the membership tokens to them, you know, for free. So when we leave, there's an existing community during the postman, and that forms the nucleus of the sub DAO. And it's really important that we put all of these resources in because it's like, you know, it's like a chemical reaction. You need a catalyst. You need something to get you over the activation energy. Otherwise, people won't come together. And so we, we do that by bringing people in, bringing our energy and expertise. And then when we leave the sub DAO behind, we give them the tools that we have, which is, you know, our marketplace, our display tech, you know, the playbook for throwing good events. And we try to give them the tools to self-organize. Yeah, I like that uh, oxymoron of uh, on-chain, offline. That's a pretty cool combo and uh, sounds like something that that's very much up my alley personally. Um, you guys are coming up, like you said, on, I think, uh, Buenos Aires is maybe the uh, seventh or eighth location. You've got Paris and, uh, you know, finishing in Venice like you started, but in Italy instead of uh, California. And uh, so once you get through with these 10 locations, um, you know, obviously that was sort of the initial goal and it seems sort of poised that there would be a next chapter after that of some kind. Do you have sort of, uh, any vision at this point or expectation of, of what could come to follow or sort of the long-term ambition of, of bright moments? I mean, our, our mission has always been progressive decentralization and this core team of people, which has fluctuated over the years and grown and shrunk in size we've always thought of ourselves as the ones who bootstrap the communities, but ultimately they need to be able to sustain on their own. And so when we finish the 10 cities, the first thing that we want to do is take a moment and appreciate the completion of this art project, right? The, there's a thousand citizens in every city. There's 10 cities. There's going to be 10,000 of these on-chain assets, which represent, you know, I, I know every token holder. I've met them in person. I've touched their hands. I, these are friends of mine and these are friends of each other. It's, it's highly networked community and it's a roadmap that's going to take three years to complete. And so we want to just reflect on the, on the fact that this project that we said we were going to do is completed now. We'll also have at that point worked with a hundred artists who have each created 100 on-chain assets, which is, you know, 10,000 assets. And so there's this really interesting duality of the 10,000 citizens, these 10,000 on-chain assets that I hope will stand the test of time as this complete art project. And, you know, looking forward, we have such a strong expertise in throwing world-class productions and events. I would love to be able to get people together regularly. I'm very inspired by existing organizations. You know, I think that things like Coachella and Burning Man are great examples of how groups of people can continue to sustain, you know, creative energy over many decades. But right now we're so focused on finishing the roadmap that we don't want to take our eyes off the ball and it's going to take everything that we have you know financially and emotionally to get to the 10th city it's really hard we all of us had careers and friends that we basically put on pause over the last few years to travel around and you know it looks really glamorous but when you're you know by yourself in a hotel room somewhere and all your friends are back home and you're trying to explain to them you know why you need to finish this thing uh, it, it's not easy. And so we just really, we want to focus on finishing. We want to focus on completing the roadmap that we set out to do. And then, you know, at that point, we're going to have the goodwill of these 10,000 people around the world. And hopefully we can continue creating, you know, amazing experiences together, but we need to earn it first. Yeah, it's super cool. And I think uh, just having an eye on, uh, you know, running through the finish line and, and just crushing the the last chapter of the project makes a ton of sense. It sounds like it's definitely been uh, you know, a long and uh, tough effort, but uh, hopefully 
seems to be paying off in, in a lot of ways and a lot of people around the world I'm, I'm sure it sounds like uh very much appreciated and and things could sort of develop outside of this i'm sure that aren't even you know the whole point of decentralization basically is you guys don't really necessarily need to determine what's next the community can kind of decide if and when uh you know it gets to that point um so i guess you know i, I know we've got a, a few minutes um coming up to to wrap up but um outside of sort of this project and uh you know we talked a bit about farcaster but is there anything else sort of in crypto that that you're paying close attention to and maybe if not you could just speak to sort of your transition from you know you talk about sort of like uh the world is sort of very slowly migrating towards crypto we still need people to sort of get wallets that are convenient and everything like this and um it might be like sort of 1995 and and all of these things but you sort of took like a fast track where you you know you started with a consulting firm and ended up you know basically leading a DAO in uh, a matter of a few years. So it's a very different lifestyle. And, you know, the way the DAOs work is quite complex. So if there's not something else in crypto that might be interesting for you to talk about, then um, just hearing what it's like to sort of be fully immersed in, you know, the crypto world, I think would be a pretty interesting place to wrap up. Sure. So, yeah, you know, I mentioned we're an on-chain organization. And so what does that mean? Um, it means we get paid in ETH which by itself is sort of a very interesting uh, experience. Um, your mood day to day, month to month is often determined by the market. And, and we don't peg people in USD. We don't say, oh, you're going to make X USD a year and we'll back it into ETH. It's like, no, you get X ETH a month. And if ETH is up, congratulations, we're happy together. And if ETH is down, we're happy together. And, and why do we do that? One, I think it, from a, a cultural standpoint, is really interesting as an organization because it means that we're all in. But two, all of our revenue is in ETH. And so it would actually be backwards for us to pay people in fiat. And I think we're going to see more of this in the future, where as revenue is denominated in you know, base layer tokens, people are being paid in that token. And then it's sort of on them to be able to you know, balance it across different currencies. And, and Bology has a great line here, which is you know, constants become variables. And so I think this is a variable that has changed for me over the last few years and will probably change for more people in the future where it's like, what currency are you paid in? Oh, oh, it's not fiat. Oh, it's not USD. No, well, it's actually, you know, Ether or Bitcoin or, or some other base level currency where the business actually operates. You know, the other thing is just the fact that we've been able to have an international team of contributors, I think is uniquely something that is possible with crypto and our ability to scale really quickly and go to these international communities and sort of find a small group of people who are very interested in what we're doing and then quickly ramp them up and give them the skills and, and processes that we've developed to, develop, to build their own community. It feels a little bit like a proto network state. It's early and it's, it's, it, you, you, you can't really, there, a lot of things are missing, but every month there's some new development. And, and the one I'm looking at right now is this idea of account abstraction and giving people ETH wallets with social logins. And it's like, this is a huge unlock. And internally we're thinking about all the ways that we can use it. And so when the protocol is changing this quickly, a lot of what we do is just try to hang on for the ride and wait for the technology to come to us and move onto the market. And there's a great story about, you know, when the iPod was being you know thought through, what actually happened was that there was a small storage um, unit that got developed that could hold, you know, a thousand songs. And this thing was just created. It was brand new. And, you know, uh, they went out and they struck a deal basically to have the exclusive license to use this thing. And without that, the iPod couldn't have existed. And you really need to have your ear to the ground. And so I think a lot of what we do in crypto and, and as this crypto native organization is just try to, you know, evaluate all the changes in the market and see what's coming. And then that, un that unlocks a lot of new things. I, you know, I'm really interested in, in what the Nouns Builder team is doing. I think their ability to unlock crypto native organizations like ours with a native governance policy that doesn't rely on off-chain snapshots or three of five multi-sigs is, you know, part of where the future will go. And then I also look at what Purple is doing as a way to fund open source goods. And so a lot of these things are, you have to see something that's very early and not quite ready yet but then be willing to extrapolate and think about it. Well, how big could this get? Right. And, and take off the skeptic hat for a moment and allow yourself to play out. Okay. If everything goes according to plan and then we work backwards, what do we need to do today to make sure we're in the right place? 
And so that's a lot of what we do. And, and we're really fortunate to have people from all over the world that give us input because not everything happens here in California. Believe it or not, there are things in, in other countries that are way ahead of what we're doing here. And so we have the benefit of physically going there and having conversations with these people who are able to share with us a little bit of what the future looks like. Awesome. Well, uh, I think we're both very much looking forward to seeing what that future looks like. And uh, it's cool to sort of have a peek through your perspective as to what's going on, especially in crypto land. And even just getting paid in ETH is a pretty unique thing. And, uh, you know, people talk about crypto sort of going from a store of value to something else, but that's quite clearly, you know, store of value, medium of exchange and unit of account for you. Uh, and with, with a lot of consequences for better or worse. So hopefully it all ends up going really well. And uh, I believe it will. But uh, thanks again, Phil. I, I know we're up on time for, for coming on. And, uh, you know, it's been great talking with you. Where can people go uh, to sort of follow your story and, and bright moments and everything like that? Yeah, so uh, I'm on I'm on Farcaster at Phil. Um, my website is my first name, last name, Phil, M-O-H-U-N.com. And then we're brightmoments.io. And so, you know, over the next year and a half, I'll be in Buenos Aires, Paris, and Venice helping to complete the roadmap. Or if you're in a city where we have a sub dial, please stop by. We have a community of really wonderful people, whether you're crypto native or not, who would love to either get you your first wallet or go deep in the weeds about something. Uh, you can find a, a home there. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks again, Phil. This is great. Yeah, talk to you soon. Thanks, Jake.